It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope. Mr. William Bradford Huey, editor of the American Mercury, and Mr. Henry Hazlitt, contributing editor of Newsweek magazine. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Right Honorable Richard G. Casey, Australian Minister of External Affairs. Mr. Casey, of course, Australia has many friends in our audience tonight because many of us were down in Australia during the war. And uh, you, of course, are the Australian Foreign Minister who's <laughs> been here for the meeting of the United Nations. Tonight, sir, I'm sure that our viewers would first like your comment on the resignation of Mr. Trig Lee as Secretary General of the UN. What uh, significance do you see in this, sir? Well, Mr. Hewitt, it was um, a most dramatic moment this afternoon when uh, Mr. Trig Lee announced his resignation from the Secretary Generalship. Uh, it was quite an emotional moment, too. Uh, he directed a good deal of what he had to say towards the communist Russians, Mr. Vyshinsky and his friends. Well, had the Russians forced him out? Well, there's been bad feeling, you know, between uh, uh, the Russians and uh, Mr. Trigger Lee. In fact, Mr. Vyshinsky the other day referred to him as um, uh, the man who calls himself the Secretary General. Well, do you regard this uh, as a blow to our side in the UN, the resignation of Lee? No, I don't uh, really think so. It's an extraordinarily difficult task, you know, being it Secretary General of an uh, immense gathering such as this. Well, ha has the resignation anything to do, or will it have any effect on our chances for achieving peace in Korea? I don't really think it's got much relationship to that, you know. We've been giving our minds in the few hours since this happened to uh, wondering uh, how we're going to get another Secretary General. And do you Is have any guessing on who that might be? <laughs> well, yes. There are certain people, I think, that would not be reluctant to be uh, asked to be Secretary General. But the difficulty is, you see, that um, uh, the Security Council has got to be unanimous about it, which means the Russians have got to agree. They, so they have the veto power on, yes, on the Secretary General. Yeah. So it's, it likely will be uh, uh, someone from a fairly neutral area, uh, like Sweden or something of that sort. I should think certainly from one of the smaller countries, you know. Uh, countries that are not uh, directly involved in the to and fro of this business. Well, Mr. Vashensky made a, another one of his long speeches there today, sir. Oh. Uh, have you had any opportunity to observe Mr. Vashensky? I'm sure that our viewers would like a reaction from you on that stormy character. Uh, yes, indeed I have. Both last year, when the United Nations was in, uh, held in Paris, and this year. Mr. Vashensky's uh, period of uh, speaking seems to me to vary between two hours as the lower limit and four hours as up to the present the upper limit. Uh, it's quite an interesting study, I think, because he, he appears to me to be doing everything possible to increase international tension by what he says and not to decrease it. Uh, the minds, of course, work uh, completely differently to ours. We say what we've got to say, what's in our minds, and that at the moment is doing everything possible towards getting a a ceasefire in Korea. Well, Whereas we, we don't try and make debating points. Uh, the thing is too serious for that. Well, is there anything personal about this attitude on his part, or is he simply following orders from Moscow and can't do anything else? Oh, well, I think he, he wouldn't uh, object to my saying that uh, he's really the mouthpiece of Moscow, and I think he's got to speak as, as directed. What would be the purpose of these four-hour speeches? Simply propaganda against the United States? Oh, certainly. Oh, yes. Oh, quite certainly. I mean, they do definitely regard this United Nations as the best uh, and cheapest propaganda platform in the world. Well, the chief purpose of your meeting now is to try to uh, make a peace in Korea, is try to uh, get a truce mm. in Korea, is it not? Oh, certainly. What progress have you been making in that? Uh, well, it's almost uh, like asking um, what progress a hen, a hen makes in laying an egg. Uh, there's not much progress until the egg is laid. And in this case, the, the egg is uh, uh, an agreement between the, our side, the, the uh, uh, United Nations side, the United States side, and the communists on their side as to the conditions of 
uh, of dealing with the prisoners of war. It's narrowed itself down to the prisoners of war problem. I'm sure that well, our viewers would like just a straight out prediction from you, Mr. Casey. How do you feel about our chances for getting a ceasefire? Are you hopeful? Well, let me put it this way. We've got to assume that the other side wants to see an end of the fighting in Korea. I mean, if they don't, well, the fighting goes on. There's no doubt about that. So we've got to make it the assumption, whether it's true or not, uh, that the communists want a ceasefire in Korea. Otherwise, all this talk is just completely beside the point. Uh, uh, we're prepared, I, I'm quite sure, to be reasonable in the matter. All we say is that the prisoners of war should uh, individually have the right to say whether they are going to be repatriated to their own country or somewhere else. Well, there's no disposition to yield on that point. Oh, I think that's, uh, that's a basic principle with us. So it's a simple there, humanitarian principle, I think. There's nothing further that the United Nations can yield on, is there? No, because it, it's, the, it's uh, uh, everything else. Uh, all the other uh, uh, factors uh, to bring about a ceasefire have already been agreed. That's the one single outstanding point. And we talk endlessly about that. Well, much has been said in our own country about the uh, upcoming visit of General Eisenhower to Korea. Mm -hmm. uh, now, sir, how do you feel about that? Do you think that some good might be served, might come from that visit? Oh, yes, indeed. I, I can very well imagine General Eisenhower wanting to go to Korea. Uh, after all, he'll see the, uh, all the top people on our side. If he goes there, he'll get their views. He'll see the terrain, what the countryside is like. Uh, he'll see uh, the, the uh, South Koreans, he'll meet Syngman Rhee, and he'll, he'll gather a very great deal of information that will enable him, I think, to deal with the problem when he uh, assumes the presidency, uh, I think, with a greater, very much greater knowledge. I, I know, sir, that, uh, that you would be extremely reluctant to comment on our internal politics, but uh, <clears throat> I wonder if you could give us an answer on this. General Eisenhower has been associated most of his career with Europe. Mm -hmm. Now, are you people in the Pacific uh, fearful that, uh, that we will neglect the Pacific area under an Eisenhower presidency? No, I don't think so at all. Personally, I'm not at all anxious on that score because General Eisenhower, uh, beyond anything else, he, he knows uh, world strategy and world tactics. And I think he can be, uh, one can be very sure that he'll sum up that situation and realize that, uh, that the world is one whole and it's no good winning the, uh, the Cold War or the Hot War in Europe uh, and leaving the other side of the picture, the East, leaving that out of account. I'm sure he'll get a balanced um, uh, conception of both sides of the picture. What do you think General Eisenhower can do in Korea that hasn't already been done? Oh, I think mainly his purpose would going, uh, uh, be going. I, I have no means of reading his mind, but I should think he'd go there to inform his own mind. Uh, to get the views of the people, uh, your senior generals and many others, who've been in close contact with this problem there for, e for, for, for nearly a couple of years. Well, if I were in his place, <coughs> uh, I, I, I would certainly want to go there. Well, assuming the Chinese communists don't at present want to cease fire, isn't there some kind of pressure that could be put on them in a military way to make them want to cease fire? Some threat that could be used? Uh, well, yes, I wouldn't be prepared offhand to suggest what it might be, but uh, I think if... Uh, uh, I would be quite reasonably sure that General Eisenhower would um, be able to discover what extra pressure could be put on them. And he'd do uh, that, I think, uh, much more easily by a visit there. On that point, sir, of course, Australia has been a rather valiant ally of ours in two wars. Now, how, does, how do the Australians feel about the war in Korea? Uh, are you uh, one of our uh, reluctant allies in Korea, or do you think the war has been worth fighting? Uh, well, of course, War is a, is a pretty unpleasant business uh, uh, at any time and wherever it is. But uh, we've been in it right from the beginning with uh, infantry and, uh, uh, and naval vessels and uh, air squadrons. And uh, we believe that this, uh, it's been essential to combat aggression in Korea. Because uh, if Korea had not been uh, uh, immediately tackled in the way that it was tackled, very largely of course by yourselves, and we believe that uh, the, the communists would have quite certainly broken out in some other place and maybe under even worse conditions than the war in Korea. I believe, in fact, that, uh, as I say, although war is a very unpleasant uh, process, wherever it is, that it's been essential to fight this war in Korea. Well, are, you are you fearful of what uh, may happen in Japan? 
of the resurgence of Japan? Well, uh, we people in Australia certainly are uh, uh, very anxious about the possibility of the revival of militarism in Japan because we, like you, have, uh, have suffered from Japanese militarism in the past. Uh, but we certainly uh, agree with you that uh, we've got to do everything possible to try and keep Japan in the democratic camp, not let her slide off onto the, the communist side. To do that, we've got to, I think, all of us help her to, uh, uh, to become a normal economy again, a normal country. Well, Mr. Casey, as a final question, I'd like to ask you about the status of the Pacific Pact now. Well, the, the, the pact, the ANZUS Pact, we call it, uh, ANZUS. Um, that's a, 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 a treaty in being. We had our meeting at Honolulu with Mr. Anderson and my New Zealand colleague and myself three or four months ago, and the military discussions are going on now. The, the planners are meeting there. Uh, it's a pact in being, and we're uh, extremely grateful and glad for its existence, I can assure you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Casey, for being with us tonight. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. The opinions that you've heard our speakers express tonight have been entirely their own. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Henry Hasler. Our distinguished guest for this evening was the Right Honorable Richard G. Casey, Australian Minister of External Affairs. The introduction and Rondo Capriccioso of Saint-Saëns, played by Michel Piastro with the Longines Symphonette, is one of the five magnificent selections on the face of this new Longines Whitnor anniversary record album. On the other face, there's a group of heartwarming selections sung by the Whitnor Coraliers. Now this 12-inch long playing album, magnificently recorded with almost a full hour of enchanting music, would cost anywhere from four to five dollars if commercially made. Now you can buy it right in your own community during the month of November as the goodwill offer of your Longines Whitnor jeweler for only one dollar ninety-five cents. This Longines Whitnor anniversary album is the November goodwill offer of your Longines Whitnor jeweler, a reliable jeweler from whom to buy diamonds and fine gold jewelry and of course Longines and Whitnor watches. From coast to coast, there are more than 4,000 Longines Whitnor jeweler agencies. Now tomorrow, take advantage of this opportunity to obtain the Symphonette and Coralier's anniversary album at only $1.95. And at the same time, see these new and beautiful Longines and Whitnor watches for Christmas giving. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem. Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. Tuesday night thrills, danger on the CBS television network.